Thank you, Ed. I am not immutable, however. <laughs> We're beginning the tenth chapter in our exposition of Hosea, and it is comforting to turn to something that is immutable, and that is the teaching of the Lord God in his word. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. Surely now they will say, We have no king, for we do not revere the Lord. As for the king, what can he do for us? They speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants. And judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Aven. And remember what our prophet is speaking about is the fact that when the northern kingdom separated from the southern kingdom in the days of Jeroboam, realizing that if something was not done about the worship in the northern kingdom, going to Jerusalem year after year for worship would surely do away with the northern kingdom. And so Jeroboam set up two calves for worship, one in Bethel, one in Dan. Now the one in Bethel is the one of which Hosea is speaking. Bethel, as you know, means house of God. Hosea calls it Beth Aven. Aven means iniquity in Hebrew. And so he speaks of Bethel, which to the northern kingdom was house of God as house of iniquity because it's in Bethel that they go to worship the calf the Jeroboam had set up. So one notices the cynicism, I guess, or the uh, sarcasm better, with which Hosea addresses those who are citizens of the northern kingdom. It's not Bethel, it's beth -Aven. Indeed, its people will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out over it, that is, the calf, over its glory since it has departed from it. God's going to do away with it because he's going to do away with the northern kingdom is what Hosea is speaking about. The thing itself will be carried to Assyria as tribute to King Yareb. Now this is a reference to the king of Assyria, and one of the characteristics of the king of Assyria, like the characteristics of uh, any person today who wants to, as sovereign over one territory, to enlarge his territory, he looks for a way in which he can uh, be critical of the place whose territory he desires. And so he will do everything he can to ultimately have a little conflict by which he can take them over. Uh, we who have lived in the 20th century have seen this particularly in Nazi Germany and the little conflicts that Hitler picked with Czechoslovakia and Austria and, and so on. And we also see it in the Soviet Union. And uh, so this king of Assyria, George Adam Smith, uh, referring to this King Yareb, because that's a term from Hebrew also, which means to have a conflict or to have a case against. The word, the Hebrew word reev means to contend with. And so he calls him King Yareb, or as George Adam Smith, the great Hebrew scholar from Scotland, translated it, King Pick a Quarrel. <laughs> so, uh, this is King Yareb, King Picker Quarrel. So the calf is going to be carried over as tribute to King Picker Quarrel. Ephraim will be seized with shame, and Israel will be ashamed of its own counsel. Samaria 
will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. Also the high places of Avin, there again, the high places of iniquity, the high places where they had the worship of the golden calf. The sin of Israel will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel. There they stand. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? When it is my desire, I will chastise them, and the peoples will be gathered against them when they are bound for their double guilt. That double guilt is probably a reference to the fact that they resorted to Baal for worship. And then when difficulty came, they resorted to worldly allies in order to help them, rather than turning to the Lord God in repentance. And Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh, but I will cover her fair neck with a yoke. Now, you know, I did not grow up on the farm. Sometimes, just rarely, sometimes I wish that I had because there's so many things I would understand in the scriptures if I had grown up on the farm. And uh, I confess that when I read the Old Testament, I often have to have my dictionary there to find out what some of the rural metaphors mean. And that puzzled me. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. Why would a heifer love to thresh? I don't know any heifers that I can ask about it. So uh, I took down my dictionary and did a little looking into it and found out that probably what this means in the light of the Old Testament is that in threshing, the work is relatively mild. That is, the heifer doesn't have a whole lot of work to do in comparison with other duties in threshing. That is, the separation of seed from the rest of the grain. And furthermore, in the Old Testament, remember, in the threshing, it was specifically stated in the book of Deuteronomy that uh, it would be right for them to not have a muzzle upon their jaws when they were threshing in order that they may be able to eat and so that was one of the gentlenesses of the Lord God revealed. And uh, therefore, he says, And Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. Those animals love to thresh rather than other duties because they could also eat. And it was light work, so to speak. But God's going to make it different. And so he says, and Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. By the way, any of you from the farm, you can come and correct me if you like, because I'm, well, I grew up in the city. But I will come over her fair neck with a yoke. I will harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will harrow for himself. So with a view to righteousness, reap in accord with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your ways, in your numerous warriors. By the way, you can notice the chain of causality in verse 13. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. So again, people who understand rural, understood rural life would understand plowing in order to sow the grain or whatever, then the reaping, and then the possessing and eating. So that's what he's speaking about when he says, you've plowed wickedness, you've reaped injustice, You've eaten the fruit of lies. This is the product of your work. Because you have trusted in your way and your numerous warriors, therefore a tumult will arise among your people, 
and all your fortresses will be destroyed, as Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle. Evidently a reference to Shalmaneser, the Assyrian king who in one of his campaigns had destroyed a place by the name of Beth Arbel. When mothers were dashed in pieces with their children, thus it will be done to you at Bethel because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel will be completely cut off. Don't you know that message was popular in Hosea's days? Don't you know the northern kingdom just waited for the word that would come from the prophet's mouth? And don't you know they gathered around and said, I just wonder what Hosea will say to us next. I can't wait to hear what that prophet has to say. Well, I imagine that probably if you had voted on the most unpopular man in the northern kingdom, Hosea would have been one of the leading candidates. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our subject this morning in the continuation of the exposition of this great prophecy of Hosea is the danger of the divided heart. Like a skillful and experienced physician, the prophet Hosea keeps probing at the core of Israel's sin, which seems to be their idolatry. Now that analysis given by another commentator upon the book seems to me to be true. Chapter 10 is the conclusion of the great discussion of Israel's pollution and Israel's punishment. In chapter 11, you'll notice that a new, new note begins to appear. It begins, when Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And so the note of compassion in the last few chapters of the book will assume importance and emphasis. But chapter 10 is a great discourse on the need of setting proper priorities before God. What are we really after? What is our purpose in life? Prosperity, happiness, good health, a long life, success, in the church, crowds, statistics, buildings. David said something that I think is very appropriate in answer to the question. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The Apostle Paul echoed it. He said, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forth toward what lies before, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One notices in both of these men a tremendous emphasis upon the one thing, the one thing that really is significant. We live in a day in which it's the belief of many people that if a person pursues one thing, then generally he is a fanatic. But if the one thing is big enough, and this one thing is big enough, then it's not fanatical to seek after the one thing of the experience of the Lord God. Now the prophet in giving the climax of his analysis of Israel's sad condition in verse 1 and verse 2 speaks of prosperity and divine blessing. One of the Hebrew commentators, I say a commentator by a Jewish man, has called this particular section Israel's misused prosperity. Israel is a luxuriant vine. Now if you have a authorized version, you will notice that your text reads Israel is an empty vine. But the text probably should be rendered Israel is a luxurious vine. The reason for that is that the Hebrew word bakach, which is the word used here, is a word that, well, really it's 
There are two different words, but they have the same sound, akash. One of them means to be luxuriant. The other word means to be empty. In fact, it's related to a word that means to make a gurgling sound. Just like you were to take uh, a bottle that was full of water and turn it up like this and then listen to the gurgling sound as the water came out, like from a flask or something. When I arrived Friday afternoon late and Martha and I went over to a restaurant, we sat down in a booth and there was a man behind me that his laugh was a gurgling sound, and it got so I could hardly eat my dinner for his laughing because somebody was telling him something constantly, and he was laughing, and it sound just, sounded just exactly like a gurgling sound, and fortunately, he couldn't see me. And uh, even Martha, who was trying to remain very discreet and very dignified through it all, even she began to laugh as he laughed with this gurgling sound. I wish I could repeat it. It was, I'm sure it'd have you all in stitches shortly because anyway, that's the other verb. <laughs> this this bakak means to be luxuriant and that's evidently the meaning here. What he is saying about Israel is that Israel is a luxuriant vine. That is, she is growing rampantly, but such a vine is not fruitful. Now, I've joked with you a bit about my viticulture, my three grape vines. I want you to know I do have grapes on my vines this year, but don't come by and ask for them because they're very green at this point. But I have three grape vines, and one of my grape vines is just like Israel luxuriant in vine and foliage, but it will take you about five minutes to find a bunch of grapes on it. Another one is not very luxuriant and not very full in leaves and vine, but, well, I have quite a few clusters of grapes on that one. So what he is saying about Israel is Israel is a vine with a lot of vine growth and a lot of leaves, but when you look for the fruit, it's just not there. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. Actually, you can find Israel's fruit not in the things that should be Israel's fruit, but you find Israel's fruit in those places of false worship that are out on the hills around Bethel and around Dan. In other words, he says, the more altars he made, the richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. And so the obelisks and the other things are characteristic of the fruit of Israel. It's very striking in a way that he should speak of Israel as a luxuriant vine, for this is one of the great figures of the nation Israel. In the Old Testament, in, for example, Psalm 80, the the writer of the psalm speaks of Israel as a vine. In the eighth verse, he says, as he describes what the Lord did in bringing Israel out of the land of Egypt so many years back, he said, Thou didst remove a vine from Egypt. Thou didst drive out the nations and didst plant it. And so the figures of God taking a grape vine and clearing the ground in order to plant his vineyard and planting it, that was Israel, but it's a figure of taking them out of the land of Egypt and bringing them into the land. In the 14th verse, we read, O God of hosts, turn again, we beseech thee, look down from heaven and take care of this vine, the psalmist says. And finally, in verse 17 through verse 20 in this prayer, he says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou didst make strong for thyself. Then we shall not turn back from thee. Revive us, and we will call upon thy name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause thy face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. The vine became a national symbol for the nation Israel. And the prophet Isaiah who ministered, as you know, in something of the same time, except to the southern kingdom. He too speaks of the vine and the figure that it is of the nation Israel in the fifth chapter of his prophecy. 
he gives what may be called a parable of the vineyard and listen to what he says. Let me now sing for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill and he dug it all around, removed its stones and planted it with the choicest vine, that's the nation Israel. And he built a tower in the middle of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Oh now, and now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. And I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed or oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. And Isaiah puts that in very uh, interesting ways in the Hebrew text. And you can see the play on words as he says, I looked for mishpat, Righteousness, but I found mishpach, oppression, bloodshed. Litzavaka for righteousness, wehene tsaaka. And instead of righteousness, tsaaka, a cry, tsaaka. So the prophet, in a beautiful way, lays tremendous stress upon what God really looked for. He looked for justice and judgment in his people. He looked for the expressions of the life that he had given to them. But instead of finding what was proper, he found oppression and bloodshed. And when he looked for righteousness, uh, he found nothing but a shrill cry as a result of the evil of the country. Now the prophet continues in chapter 10 of Hosea by saying, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. Ah, he's fruitful, all right. Look at him. He's a luxuriant vine. All of the vine growing rapidly as if he has the finest kind of fertilizer and the finest kind of ground. And when you look at it, it's a massive vine now with the leaves and the vine trailing all over everything. It looks very, very fruitful. But it's not fruitful at all. It's fruit not for God, because that is the fruit for which God looks, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of justice, the fruit of the manifestation of spiritual life, but he finds just the opposite. It's fruit for himself. And as he looks out over the land expecting to find people worshiping the Lord God and listening and reading the word of God and seeking also to influence people for the truth of Jehovah, looking forward to the feast days and the feast times of fellowship with one another and with the Lord God over the things of the Lord God and looking in hope for the coming of the Messiah, what does he find? The land filled with altars to false gods, the land filled with the obelisks that are addressed for the worship of Baal. And so he's fruitful, all right, but he's fruitful in the things that are dishonor to the Lord God who has brought them out of Egypt, brought them into the land, planted them in the fertile land after clearing away of the rocks and the things that would prevent the fruit from growing. In other words, God has been mislaid. God is lost and forgotten so far as they are concerned. The nation's passion, the nation's purpose is long gone. Instead of being witnesses for him as he had expected them to be, they are witnesses for the other kinds of things that characterize the life out of God. Listen to what 
the prophet Isaiah says again around the same time. He says, you are my witnesses, declared the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there is none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declared the Lord, and I am God. But instead, fruit for themselves. Now the prophet continues. He says, their heart is faithless. One of the commentators translates this as false. Their heart is false. Another translates it, their heart is tricky. And as you know, in the authorized version, we have their heart is divided. Well, if we were to be strictly true to the Hebrew text, it should be rendered faithless or false. But when a heart is faithless and false, in spiritual things, having made great profession of the truth of God, then usually it's because that heart is divided. And so the faithless falsity of the human heart is a result of its divided condition. It's false. It's false in the sense that it is deceptive. Strictly speaking, this word means something like smooth, but smooth, deceptive. Well, a person, we say, he, speak, he speaks very smoothly, but often we mean he's very deceitful. He doesn't mean exactly what he says. He really is a smooth talker, but you better watch out for him. It's like the psalmist said, his mouth was smoother than butter, but ultimately false because the heart is divided. Strictly speaking, this word was also used since it meant smooth, essentially, in its root. It was used of dice, of playing games with dice. And one of the commentators said that what they are doing and what was characteristic of them is characteristic of us today when we speak of a man who is dicing away his inheritance. We mean he's gambling it away. And what they were doing was gambling with God. They were gambling their own basic well-being by the things that they were doing. So their heart is faithless. Their heart is divided. They're dicing their inheritance away. They are gambling with God. They have false and tricky hearts. In other words, instead of having an encounter with the Lord God, they are evading him. Now, do you think that could possibly happen in Believer's Chapel? Do you think that it could possibly happen where the word of God is preached, that we should have people who would avoid an encounter with the Lord God and seek really to evade him and do it in spiritual language? Uh, one doesn't have to read much of the Bible to know that that's where you should look for that. That's really where you should look for it. You should look for it in the midst of the people who belong to the covenant of God. These were people who had the covenants. They had the Abrahamic covenant. They had the Mosaic covenant. They had the Davidic covenant. They were to have the new covenant. These are the people of whom Hosea is speaking about. He's talking about the covenant people. And if you think that human nature is different because it's 1984 and not the 8th century before the time of our Lord, ah, you don't understand human nature at all. This is the same human nature of which we have participated ourselves. And we can sit in Believer's Chapel and we can look very spiritual, but you know it's possible to be gambling with God in Believer's Chapel just as it is anywhere else. And in fact, it's possible even to look very fruitful, a luxuriant vine producing fruit, not for the Lord God, but fruit for ourselves. 
Now the prophet with the third verse goes on to speak about pollution and judgment because God is a God of righteousness. He's not soft-hearted like we are. He doesn't say, well, they're not really serving the Lord God, but I cannot really bring myself to discipline them. Uh, God is not like that for our good. And so he says, surely now they will say, we have no king, for we do not revere the Lord. As for a king, what can he do for us? It's very revealing of the depth to which Israel, the covenant people, have descended. Think of it. They've descended to this depth where they are able to say, we have no king. We don't revere the Lord. As for the king, what can he do for us? Now, Hosea was probably the king at this time, and he was a puppet of Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria, and perhaps they are talking about him in that way. They, they freely admit that the reason for their political humiliation is we don't revere the Lord. Then they ask, then he asks, uh, or they ask the cynical question in sour grapes of what value is a king? They only make empty covenants. And so God goes on to speak. They speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants. Judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear. He talks about their, their calf at Beth Oven that we've talked about. And then finally he says, Samaria in the seventh verse will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. Uh, who as a child has not stood by a little stream and thrown out a pebble in the stream and watch it sink to the bottom and then, well, let's take a little twig. Let's throw that on the water. And so you throw the twig out on the water and you, you kind of watch to see in which way the twig will go down the stream. I can still remember standing by Town Creek in Jasper, Alabama as a kid where my grandmother lived and throwing things out on the water because there was not a whole lot of water but they had a little stream down the dry bed and I would throw it out of it sometimes, dam it up. I had the real dam of the whole little city right there out in front of my grandmother's house. And then I would put things on the water and just watch it go down and see it go down and also the few little fishes, watch them because you could see it, the water was clear. That's what Hosea is talking about here when he says Samaria will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water and will have no stability any longer. The helplessness of the king and the helplessness of the people is beautifully set out by that figure. And then he says the high places of Aven, iniquity, the sin of Israel. This is the last word on man-made religion. It's the sin of Israel to set up a worship to the false god. Oh, we don't have that. We don't set up any worship of the false god. No, we have little angels standing on the side top of a building down here. It's the same kind of thing, but we don't do that in Believer's Chapel. We do it quietly in Believer's Chapel. We set up materialism or whatever it may be as our little false god. But we don't do it outwardly because, of course, that's not the thing to do. And one of the great statements of the New Testament is found here in the 8th verse. The high places of Avin, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. That's the last word of Israel's, on la Israel's, Israel's man-made religion. Thorns and thistle will grow on, on their altar. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. And that is the last word on human arrogance and independence. There are two New Testament fulfillments of this. Over in the book of Luke, the Lord Jesus makes reference to this because, as I've said before, you know, our Lord was a student of the Old Testament. He read all of these things. He pondered them as the man. And as he is 
Going toward Calvary's cross, he turns to the daughters of Jerusalem who are standing by him as he goes. Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. This is Luke 23, 28. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. In other words, they, in their taking of me to Calvary's cross, will ultimately realize that their hope is gone. There is no way in which they can face the eternal God, and then anything that will prevent them from entering into the presence of the Lord God will be welcome. Even the hills and the mountains falling upon them will be better than facing the Lord God. And then in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16, the ultimate fulfillment of this in the future, when in the time of the second advent, and John giving his great revelation says in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 6, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's one of history's greatest prayer meetings, but they are praying not to the Lord God to whom they should have prayed, but praying to the mountains and to the rocks to fall upon them. You know, it's a terrible thing to fail to pray when there is time for prayer and then to be forced to pray when there is no hope. But that is what the scriptures set out for us as part of the way in which the Lord God deals with us. And now in the ninth verse, from the days of Gibeah, we talked about that last week. That's, of course, one vicious episode in Israel's past. From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel, there they stand. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? And then the final words of admonition and appeal in verse 11 through verse 15. The admonition in verse 11 and verse 13 through verse 15. And Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh, but I will come over her fair neck with a yoke, and I will harness Ephraim, Judah will plow, Jacob will harrow for himself. Verse 13, you have plowed wickedness, you have reaped injustice, you have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your way, in your numerous warriors. Final alarms for the nation, which will never know another king apart from the Davidic line, the northern kingdom. The kingship of the northern kingdom was abolished in the captivity. The appeal in verse 12 is, so with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. Break up your fallow ground. That's a magnificent text. It's often been used as a text, of course. What kind of ground is fallow ground? Well, again, I wish I'd grown up in the country. But fallow ground is ground that you let lie. Usually, because it's ground that will be helped by lying fallow or lying idle for a time. But fallow ground, if left, will ultimately become hard, difficult to deal with, difficult to plow, filled with weeds, filled with all kinds of other things that make it very difficult to deal with. And so the ground that lies fallow is the ground in which difficulties are found. Break up your fallow ground. You know, if we saw a person who had a farm and he was not caring for his farm, we'd say, 
What a foolish farmer. If he let us ground lie fallow, we'd say he's crazy. What about a person who lets his spiritual ground lie fallow? Well, man is made up of body, mind, or spirit. As a matter of fact, we're living in a day in which people are very, very concerned about their bodies. Everybody is. And everybody's concerned about their health. Eat the right things. Take exercise. You can hardly drive your car. You're going to run over a jogger. Or if it's not that, health club. A couple of blocks over. Big one. Expensive one, too. Everybody's concerned about their health. Now, it's all right to be concerned about your health. Things you eat, the things you do, the kind of life you live. But imagine a person who is concerned about his body and his mind. He's not concerned about that. Live and enjoy life, eat, drink, and be merry, but keep your body in good condition. Or, let's think a little more about this. Care for my body, but my spirit, let it lie fallow. How foolish. How foolish can a person be to be so concerned about his body or even his mind? Some ought to be more concerned about their minds, mind you. But my spirit, let my spirit lie fallow. How foolish that is. How foolish to be concerned about things that are not nearly so significant as my spirit. It's amazing that we can read something like this and realize that this is something that has happened to man from the beginning since Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. He can care about his body, he can care about his mind, but his spirit or his soul. Now Hosea says, for it is time to seek the Lord. When? Well, when you're young, first of all. When you're young. When your mind and your spirit, it seems, are often tenderer to the things of the Lord God. But if you don't as a child, if you don't as a young person, you will find it even more and more difficult as the years go by. The time is now, the time is when you're young, but the time also is when you're old if you haven't been seeking him up to that time. It's time to seek the Lord. Seek, think of it, seek the Lord. Where can the Lord be found? Down the hall there? Over in one of the classrooms here, out on the parking lot, at home, downtown Dallas. Ridiculous when you think about it. The Lord's here. He's here. He's right here with us. We don't have to seek the Lord in that sense. He's right there waiting for us to call upon him. You can imagine a person saying, but I'm not worthy. Uh, Hosea says it's time to seek the Lord. Or someone says, well, I don't know whether I'm really one of the elect or not. How foolish. You can make that decision very quickly by seeking the Lord. You seek the Lord, that settles the question. You seek the Lord, you find the Lord, you can say, I'm one of the elect. You can never know whether you're one of the elect until you have sought the Lord. That's only an evasion. You don't want that encounter, so evasion. I don't know whether I'm one of the elect. Dr. Johnson talks about the elect all the time. I don't know whether I'm one of the elect or not. I don't know whether I can seek the Lord. Uh, now, in case you have any difficulty about seeking the Lord and have difficulty in finding him, remember, oftentimes in our experience, Seeking the Lord comes to be an experience that stretches over a little period of time. 
Hosea represents that when he says, until he comes to rain righteousness on you. I was reading one of the commentators and he likened this to Elijah praying on Mount Carmel after he'd won his great victory there and he was going to tell, a tell King Ahab that it was going to rain. And so he had his little servant by his side and he said, uh, as he was down on his knees on the top of Mount Carmel, he said, go and look and see if the rain's coming. And he went, came back, said, there's no sign of the rain. Elijah said, go again. Came back, there's no sign of the rain. Go again. This went on until finally the seventh time. Can you not imagine Gehazi, his servant, was saying, for goodness sakes, I'm tired. And he said, go again for the seventh time. And he came back and he said, well, there's a little cloud out there. It's about the size of your hand. And Elijah said, get up, get going. You better go tell Ahab it's going to rain because his chariot out here is going to get clogged up in the mud. If he doesn't, in a hurry, go back to the capital. And you can see everybody gets in there, whatever the conveyance they had, and King Ahab is in his chariot. And who's leading the procession? Elijah the prophet, the man who sought the Lord until he found him and sought his answer. Well, let me conclude because our time is up. It's a solemn fact that we're all sowing every day of our lives. Are we sowing to the will of God? Or are we sowing to ourselves? And the solid test of the life of the church and the individual is our passion and our purpose. Is it the crowd, the whirl of the machinery, materialism, all of the things with which Satan would obstruct our seeking the face of the Lord God. Is it the multiplication of the pillars and the obelisks and the altars? Is our heart, like Israel's heart, a smooth, divided heart? We may stand, of course, and be divided in creed and in our view of the ordinances and things like that, but you cannot be divided in heart. It's a fearful disease to have a divided heart. You'll notice he says it's a divided heart, not a divided mind, because the vital organ is the heart. No physician can ultimately heal the human heart. And it has its awful symptoms. One of the symptoms of the divided heart, formality. Yes, we attend the church. We attend a Bible-believing church. We attend a church in which the doctrines of the grace of God are proclaimed. Formality. No real understanding of the things of God. No real appreciation of them. That's the divided heart. Inconsistency. On Sunday, we are spiritual. We think and on Monday, we don't really care too much. Or another symptom, we're interested in all kinds of things. We're interested in religion, we're interested in politics, we're interested in society and in the social things of life. And we can speak of religious things, but we often speak of them frivolously, of course. And we cite little texts of the Bible in order to justify humorously the things that we are doing flippancy in the things of the law, that's a sign of the divided heart too. And we do not realize the terrible consequences of it. You know, it is a sad fact, but in evangelicalism in our city, so often these things exist. Two, three years ago, a couple who are not members of this church called me and they said they were changing their line of business and they were looking for a place in which to set up a business. They had made contact with a national distributor of hardware. If I said the name, you'd all know it. And they had an arrangement with them when they found the place that they would build the store and this company would back them and so they made arrangements with a, a Christian real estate agent, a member of one of our evangelical churches in North Dallas. 
And so the Christian real estate agent traveled with them all over the city. They went to various places of the city looking for the precise place. And finally, they found what they thought would be the ideal spot. And so when they began to make arrangements to buy the property, they discovered to their amazement that it had been sold to a friend of the real estate agent, a Christian friend of the real estate agent. In other words, the Christian was the one with the divided, deceptive heart. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing? No, that's human nature. That's what follows if we do not give the Lord God the place that he should have in our lives. The prayer of the Old Testament saint was, Unite my heart to fear thy name. May God give us a united heart, not a divided heart. May God help us to realize that the only true security lies in the right relationship with the Lord God. If you're here this morning and you have never believed in Jesus Christ, your heart is lost. And may God help you to realize that Jesus Christ has offered an atoning sacrifice and it's time to seek the Lord. And if you seek him out of a genuine heart, you shall find him. Find him as your Savior and Lord. May God help you to come to him. Shall we stand for the benediction?